Hello and welcome to this module, module 10 in educational psychology, where we will be talking about student motivation. Now, students assign various meaning and attitudes to academic activities. Their personal meanings and attitudes, and these arouse the energies in different ways within a person. And we speak in terms of these energies as motivation or the motivation to learn. But there's a lot of diversity in what motivates someone within the classroom. It's comparable in, in importance to prior knowledge or ability or readiness to engage in the activity. And when it comes to school learning, motivation has a special importance because there's no guarantee that a student wants to learn. A student in a classroom in a developed country simply means, at least early on, that the student and the teacher live in, in a society where education is compulsory. And so teachers can't take for granted that students want to learn, that they want to be there. And because of this complexity, teachers need to develop the skill of motivating a student to do what the student is required to do anyways. So it's important to keep the student engaged, to uh, motivate behavior change, to help the student to identify goals and interests and ascribe attributions and meanings to success and think of what are the beliefs and principles of self-efficacy that can be used in engaging the student to want to learn. So that's what we'll be talking about in today's lecture. Now, when we speak in terms of behavior, we're trying to be very scientific about this. And that, this is kind of where behaviorism comes in. Uh, so sometimes it's useful to think of motivation not as something inside a student driving the student's behavior, but as equivalent to the student's outward behaviors. And this is the perspective of behaviorism, which is a way to think about the learning process. And it's most thorough form, behaviorism focuses almost completely on what can be directly seen and observed and heard in a person's behavior, and has relatively little to say about what goes on underneath. Now, when it comes to motivation, this perspective see, means minimizing or even ignoring the distinction between inner drive or energy of the student and the outward behaviors that express the drive or the energy. Within behaviorism, these two are really considered the same. Uh, equating the inner and the outward might for us at from time seem to violate common sense, but because the goal is to simply have a behavior, uh, within behaviorism, they're interested in focusing upon what is going on with a student. So sometimes the circumstances of teaching limit teachers' ability to distinguish with, between the inner motivation and the outward behavior. And certainly teachers see plenty of student behavior, signs of motivation of some sort, but the multiple demands of teaching can limit the time needed to determine what the behavior means. If a student asks a lot of questions during discussions, for example, is the student Q 
curious about the material itself or just wanting to look intelligent in front of classmates and the teacher. In a class with a lot of students and a busy agenda, there might not be a lot of time for the teacher to decide between these possibilities. In other cases, the problem may not be limited time, but communication about difficulties with the student. Consider a student who's learning English or who belongs to a cultural community that uses patterns of conversation that are unfamiliar to the teacher or who has a disability that limits the student's general language skill. In these cases, discerning the student's inner motivations may take more time and more effort. And it's important to invest the extra time and effort for such students. But while a teacher is doing so, it is also important for the teacher to guide and influence the student's behavior in constructive directions. And so sometimes the behaviorist approach can be very helpful in these terms. Now, if you remember, we've already talked about the idea of operant conditioning. Now we're going to talk about that idea in terms of motivation. Within the operant model, there is the idea that of transforming motivation. In the operant model, if you recall when we talked about it before, a behavior being learned, the operant, increases in frequency or likelihood because performing it was a reinforcement or makes a reinforcement available. Now to understand this model in terms of motivation, think of the likelihood of response as the motivation and the reinforcement as the motivator. Now imagine, for example, that a student learns by operant conditioning to answer questions during class discussions. Each time the student answers a question, the operant, the teacher praises, reinforces, in other words, this behavior. In addition to thinking of this situation as behavioral learning, you can also think of it in terms of motivation. The likelihood of the student answering questions, the motivation, is increasing because the teacher's praise is available the motivator. So when you think in those terms, motivation with behaviorism can be very helpful. Now, naturally, we think generally in terms of motivation as something that flows from the inside towards something on the outside. So sometimes behaviorism can be difficult to think of as motivation. But what about motives as goals? So one way motives vary is by the kind of goals that students set for themselves and by the how the goals support students' academic achievement. So as you might expect, some goals encourage academic achievement more than others. But even motives that do not concern academics explicitly tend to affect learning indirectly. So what kinds of achievement goals do students hold? Now, think of different students. We'll, we'll use in this example Maria, Sarah, and Lindsay are taking algebra together. Maria's main concern is to learn the material as well as possible because she finds it interesting and because she believes it will be useful in later courses and perhaps in university and perhaps in her later life. Hers is a mastery goal because she wants primarily to learn and master the material. 
That's Maria. Sarah, however, is concerned less about algebra than about getting top marks in the exams and in the course. Hers is a performance goal because she is focused primarily on looking successful. Learning algebra is merely a vehicle for performing well in the eyes of peers and teachers. And then finally, Lindsay, for her part, is primarily concerned about avoiding a poor or failing mark. Hers is a performance avoidance goal or failure avoidance goal because she is not really as concerned about learning algebra as Maria or about competitive success as Sarah. She is simply intent on avoiding failure. Now, as you might imagine, mastery, performance, and performance avoidance goals often are not experienced in pure form, but in different combinations. If you play the clarinet in the school band, you might want to improve your technique simply because you enjoy playing as well as possible, essentially a mastery operation. But you might also want to look talented in the eyes of your classmates, a performance orientation. Another part of what you may wish, at least privately, is to avoid looking like a complete failure at, being, at playing the clarinet. Now, one of these motives may predominate over the others, but they all may be present. Mastery goals tend to be associated with enjoyment of learning the material at hand. And in this sense, represent an outcome that teachers often seek for students. By definition, therefore, they are a form of intrinsic motivation. As such, mastery goals have been found to be better than performance goals at sustaining a student's interest in a subject. Now, in one review of research about learning goals, students with primarily mastery orientations towards a course that they were taking not only tended to express greater interest in the course, but also continued to express interest well beyond the official end of the course and to enroll in further courses in the same subject. Performance goals, on the other hand, imply an extrinsic motivation and tend to show the mixed effects of this orientation. A positive effect is that students with a performance orientation do tend to get higher grades than those who express mastery uh, a mastery uh, orientation. The advantage in grades occurs both in the short term with individual assignments and in the long term with overall GPAs that are higher when graduating. But there's evidence that performance-oriented students do not actually learn material as deeply or permanently as students who are more mastery-oriented. And a possible reason for that measure of performance, such as test scores, often reward relatively shallow memorization of information and therefore guide performance oriented students away from processing the information thoughtfully or deeply. Another possible goal is that performance orientation by focusing on gaining recognition as the best among peers encourages competition among peers. Giving and receiving help from classmates is thus not in the self-interest of a performance-oriented student. And the resulting isolation limits the student's learning. Let's go on now to speak of motives as interests. 
In addition to holding different kinds of goals with consequent differences in academic motivation, students show obvious differences in levels of interest in the topic and tasks of the classroom. Suppose that two high school classmates, let's call them Frank and Jason, both are taking chemistry and specifically learning how to balance chemical equations. Frank finds the material boring and has to force himself to study it. And as a result, he spends only the time needed to learn the basic material and to complete the assignment at a basic level. Jason, on the other hand, enjoys the challenges of balancing chemical equations. He thinks of the task as an intriguing puzzle. He not only solves each of them, but also compares the problems to each other as he goes through them. Frank's learning is based on effort compared to Jason's, whose learning is based fully on interest. Now, as these examples imply, when students learn from interest, they tend to devote more attention to the topic than if they learn from effort. The finding is it isn't surprising since interest is another aspect of what we call intrinsic motivation, the energy or drive that comes from within. The distinction between effort and interest really though is artificial because the two motives often get blended or combined in a student's personal experiences. Now most of us can remember times when we worked at a skill that we enjoyed and found interesting but that also required effort to learn. The challenge for teachers is therefore to draw on and encourage students' interests in as much as possible and thus keep the required effort within reasonable bounds, neither too hard nor too easy. Now, students' interests vary in how deeply or permanently they're located within students. There's situational interests, and these are ones that are triggered temporarily by features of the immediate situation, unusual sights, sounds, or words that stimulate interest, that stimulate the, the situational interest. A teacher might show an interesting image and play a brief bit of music that surprises the student, but that can soon pass. At a more abstract level, unusual and surprising topics of discussion can also arouse interest when they are first introduced. Now, personal interests are relatively permanent preferences of the student and are usually expressed in a variety of situations. In the classroom, a student may or may not have a personal interest in particular topics, activities, or subject matter. Outside class, though, the student usually has additional personal interests in particular non-academic activities, sports and music, or even in particular people, celebrities or friends that live nearby. The non-academic personal interests may sometimes conflict with academic interests. And it may be more interesting to go to the shopping mall with friends than to study even their most favorite subject. Now, there are some benefits of personal interest. In general, personal interest in an academic topic or activity tends to correlate with achievement related to the topic or activity. You know, as you might suppose, a student who is truly interested is more likely to focus on the topic or activity more fully. 
to work at it for longer periods, to use more thoughtful strategies in learning, and to enjoy doing so. Small wonder, then, that the student achieves more. It's a persistent ambiguity about this benefit, however. It's often not clear whether personal interest leads to higher achievement or higher achievement leads to stronger interest. Either possibilities are plausible. And research to sort them out suggests that at least some of the influence goes in the direction from interest to achievement. When elementary students were given books with, from which to learn about a new topic, for example, they tended to learn more from books which they chose themselves than from books that were simply assigned. So interests seem to lead to learning. But this conclusion does not rule out its converse, that achievement may stimulate interest as well. So you need to be mindful of both as you teach your students. Then there's motivation as self-efficacy. In addition to being influenced by their goals, interests, and attributions, students' motives are affected by specific beliefs about their personal capacities. In self-efficacy theory, the beliefs become a primary explicit explanation for motivation. Self-efficacy is the belief that you are capable of carrying out a specific task or of reaching a specific goal. Note that the belief and the action or goal are specific. Self-efficacy is a belief that you can write an acceptable term paper, for example, or you can repair an automobile, or you can make friends with the new student in class. And these are relatively specific beliefs and tasks. Self-efficacy is not about whether you believe that you are intelligent in general, whether you always like working with mechanical things or think that you are generally a likable person, these more general judgments are better regarded as various mixtures of self-concepts, beliefs about general personal identity or of self-esteem, evaluations of identity. They are important in their own right and sometimes influence motivation, but only indirectly. Self-efficacy beliefs, furthermore, are not the same as true or documented skill or ability. They are self-constructed, meaning that they are personally developed perceptions. There can sometimes, therefore, be discrepancies between a person's self-efficacy beliefs and the person's abilities. You can believe that you can write a good term paper, for example, without actually being able to do so, and vice versa. You can believe yourself incapable of writing a paper, but discover that you, in fact, are able to do so. And in this way, self-efficacy is like the everyday idea of confidence, except that it is defined more precisely. And as with confidence, it is possible to have either too much or too little self-efficacy. The optimum level seems to be either at or slightly above true capacity. Self-efficacy may sound like a uniformly desirable quality, but research 
as well as teacher's experience suggest that it effects are a bit more complicated than they first appear. Self-efficacy has three main effects, each of which has both a dark or undesirable side and a positive desirable side. The first effect is that self-efficacy makes students more willing to choose tasks that are already, that they already feel confident in succeeding in. This effect is almost inevitable given the definition of the concept of self-efficacy. And it has also been supported by research on self-efficacy beliefs. For teachers, the effect on choice can be either welcome or not, depending upon the circumstances. If a student believes that the student can solve mathematical problems, then the student is more likely to attempt the mathematical homework that this teacher assigns. Unfortunately, the converse is also true. If the student believes that they are incapable of math, then the student is less likely to attempt the homework in math. Since self-efficacy is self-constructed furthermore, it is also possible for students to miscalculate or misperceive their true skill. And they, this misperception of themselves can have complex effects on the student's motivation. From a teacher's point of view, all is well even if students overestimate their capacity but actually do succeed at a relevant task anyway or if they underestimate their capacity, yet discover that they can succeed and raise their self-efficacy beliefs as a result. But all may not be well, though, if the, student, if the students do not believe that they can succeed, and therefore they don't even try. Or if students overestimate their capacity by a wide margin, and then are disappointed unexpectedly at the failure or achieving lower than their self-efficacy beliefs. A second effect of high self-efficacy is to increase a persistence in relevant tasks. If you believe that you can solve crossword puzzles, but encounter one that takes longer than usual, then you are more likely to work longer at the puzzle until you really do solve it. This is probably a desirable behavior in many situations unless the persistence happens to interfere with others. For example, interfering with more important tasks like doing your homework rather than working on the crossword puzzle. If you happen to have low self-efficacy for crosswords, on the other hand, then you are more likely to give up early on when you encounter a difficult puzzle. And then finally, high self-efficacy for a task not only increases a person's persistence at a task, but also improves their ability to cope with stressful conditions and to recover their motivation following an outright failure. Now suppose that you have two assignments, uh, an essay and a science lab report. They're both due on the same day and this circumstance promises to make your life hectic as the deadline approaches. You'll cope better with the stress of multiple assignments if you already believe yourself capable of doing both of the tasks than if you believe yourself capable of doing just one of them, or especially of doing neither. You will also recover better in the unfortunate event that you end up with a poor grade on one or both of the tasks. Now that's the good news. The bad news, at least for, from a teacher's point of view, is that the same resilience can sometimes also serve non-academic and non-school purposes. 
So suppose instead of two school assignments due on the same day, a student has one school assignment due, but also holds a part-time evening job as a server at a local restaurant. Suppose further that the student has high self-efficacy for both of these tasks. The student believes, in other words, that they are capable of completing the assignment as well as continuing to work at their job. The result of such a resilient belief can easily be that the student devotes less attention to their schoolwork than would be ideal. And so they end up with a lower grade on the assignment than they were capable of. Now, what about motivation as self-determination? Now, common sense suggests that human motivations originate from some sort of inner need. That there is a need within the person, a need for food, for example, or a need for companionship that influences our choices and our activities. And the same idea also forms part of some theoretical accounts of motivation, though the theories differ in the needs that they emphasize or recognize. For example, Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, as an example of motivations that function like needs that influence long-term personal behavior. According to Maslow, individuals must satisfy physical survival needs before they seek to satisfy needs of belonging. They satisfy belonging needs before esteem needs and so on. In theory, too, people have both deficit needs and growth needs. And the deficit needs must be satisfied before growth needs can influence behavior. In Maslow's theory, as in others that use this concept, a need is a relatively long-lasting condition or feeling that requires relief or satisfaction and that tends to influence action over the long term. Some needs may decrease when satisfied, like hunger, but others may not, like curiosity. Either way, needs differ from the self-efficacy beliefs that we just discussed, which are relatively specific and cognitive and affect particular tasks and behaviors fairly directly. Now, a recent theory of motivation based on the ideas of needs is self-determination theory. And this theory proposes that understanding motivation requires taking into account three basic human needs. Autonomy, the need to feel free of external constraints and behavior. Competence, the need to feel capable or skilled. And relatedness, the need to feel connected or involved with others. Now note that these needs are all psychological, not physical. Hunger and sex, for example, are not on this list. They are also about personal growth or development, not about deficits that a person tries to reduce or eliminate. Unlike food in behaviorism or safety in Maslow's hierarchy, you can never get enough autonomy, competence, or relatedness. You and your students will seek to enhance these continually throughout their life. The key idea of self-determination theory is that when persons such as you or your students feel that these basic needs are reasonably well met, they tend to perceive their actions and choices to be intrinsically motivated or self-determined. And in this case, they can turn their direction to a variety of activities that they find attractive or important, but that they do not relate directly to their basic needs. Now, among your students, for example, some individuals might read books that you have suggested, and others might listen attentively when you explain key concepts from the unit that you happen to be teaching. 
If one or more basic needs are not met well, however, people will tend to feel coerced by outside pressures or external incentives. They may become preoccupied, in fact, with satisfying whatever need has not been met and thus exclude or avoid activities that might otherwise be interesting, um, educational, or important. If the persons are students, their learning is going to suffer. Now, in proposing the importance of needs then, Self-determination theory is asserting the importance of intrinsic motivation. The self-determination version of intrinsic motivation, however, emphasizes a person's perception of freedom rather than the presence or absence of real constraints on, edge, on the action. Self-determination means a person feels free, even if the person is also operating within certain external constraints. In principle, a student can experience self-determination if, even if the student must, for example, live within externally imposed rules of appropriate classroom behavior. To achieve a feeling of self-determination, however, the student's basic needs must be met. Needs for autonomy, competence, and relatedness. In motivating students, then, the bottom line is that teachers have an interest in helping students to meet their basic needs and in not letting school rules or teachers' own leadership styles interfere or block the satisfaction of the students' basic needs. Pure self-motivation or self-determination may be the ideal for teachers and students, of course, but the reality is usually different. For a variety of reasons, teachers in most classrooms cannot be expected to meet all the students' basic needs all the time. One reason is the sheer number of students, which makes it impossible to attend to every student perfectly at all times. Another reason is teachers' responsibility for curriculum, which can require creating expectations for students' activities that sometimes conflict with students' autonomy or make them feel, temporarily at least, less than fully competent. But another reason is students' personal histories, ranging from broken relationships or... Um, coming from a broken home or a conflictual home or living in poverty, which all may create needs in some individuals which are beyond the power of the teacher to remedy. Now I want to just kind of leave us with a, a little idea for integrating the ideas about motivation. It's called target. Uh, it's a model of motivation that integrates many ideas about motivation. And I think it's helpful for you to remember this acronym of target. And it stands for the six elements of effective motivation. Task, authority, recognition, grouping, evaluating, t and time. Now, each of these elements contributes to a student's motivation either directly or indirectly. The task. Now, students experience tasks in terms of their value, their expectation of success, and their authenticity. The value of a task is assessed by its importance interest to the student, usefulness or utility, and the cost in terms of effort and time to achieve it. Expectation of success is assessed by a student's perception of the difficulty of a task. Generally, a middling level of difficulty is optimal for students. Too easy, and the task seems trivial not valuable or meaningful, and too hard, and the task seems unlikely to succeed, 
and in this sense, useless. Authenticity refers to how much a task relates to real life experiences of the students. The more it does so, the more it can build on students' interests and goals, and the more meaningful and motivating it, it, it becomes. Then there's autonomy. The motivation is enhanced in students when students feel a degree of authority or responsibility for a learning task. Autonomy strengthens self-efficacy and self-determination. Two valued and motivating attitudes that we've already talked about. Where possible, teachers can enhance autonomy by offering students choices about assignments and by encouraging them to take initiative about their learning. Then recognition. Teachers can support students' motivation by recognizing their achievements appropriately. Much depends, however, on how this is done. Praise sometimes undermines performance. It's not especially effective if praise is very general and lacking in detailed reasons for the praise, or if praise is for qualities which the student cannot influence, like intelligence instead of effort or if praise is offered so widely that it loses meaning or even becomes a signal that performance has been standard. There's some paradoxical effects, but we do know that praise works. Recognition, when it's specific, works in motivation. And then grouping. Motivation is affected by how students are grouped together for their work. There are many ways to group students, but they tend to fall into three types, cooperative, competitive, and individualistic. In cooperative learning, a set of students work together to achieve a common goal, for example, producing a group presentation for the class. Often, they receive a final grade or part of a final grade in common. In competitive learning, students work individually and their grades reflect comparisons among the students. And individualistic learning, students work by themselves, but their grades are unrelated to the performance of their classmates. And research that compares these three forms of grouping tend to favor cooperative learning groups, which apparently supports the students' needs for belonging an idea important in self-determination theory. And then evaluation. Grouping students obviously affect how students' efforts are evaluated. A focus on comparing students, as happens in competitive structures, can distract students from thinking about the material they, they've learned and to focus instead on how they appear to external authorities. The question shifts from what am I learning to what will the teacher think about my performance? A focus on cooperative learning, on the other hand, can have the double-edged effects. Students are encouraged to help their group mates, but may also be tempted to rely excessively on others' efforts or alternatively to ignore each other's contributions and over-specialize their own contributions. So some compromise between cooperative and individualistic structure seems to create the optimal motivation for learning. And then time. As every teacher knows, Students vary in the amount of time needed to learn almost any material or task. Accommodating the differences can be challenging, but also important for maximizing the student's motivation. School days are often filled with interruptions and mixed intervals of time devoted to non-academic activities and facts that make it difficult 
to be flexible about granting individuals different amounts of time to complete academic tasks. Nonetheless, a degree of flexibility is usually possible. Larger blocks of time can sometimes be created for important activities, for example, writing an essay. And sometimes enrichment activities can be arranged for students while others receive extra attention from the teacher on core or basic tasks. The bottom line about motivation is that sooner or later, when you teach, there will be situations appropriate for each perspective about motivation that we've talked about. There will be times when focusing exclusively on students' appropriate behavior or lack thereof will be both necessary and sufficient evidence of motivation. But there will be other times when it's important to encourage the student's belief that they can accomplish specific tasks. And still other times when providing for students' underlying needs for competence or social connection is important. So think of these perspectives as alternatives to be used either individually or in combination when the timing is right. Now, because of your own values and attitudes and beliefs, you may find one perspective more personally compatible than the other. And even if you settle on a favorite way of motivating your students, I still encourage you to keep the other less favored approaches in reserve and experiment with them from time to time. An eclectic approach to motivation will enrich your teaching. It will enrich your students' motivation and encourage them to learn well. Motivation is the energy or drive that gives behavior direction and focus. And you and it can be understood in a variety of ways, and each of which has implications for teaching. One perspective on motivation comes from behaviorism and equates underlying drives or motives with their outward visible expression of behavior. Most others, however, come from cognitive theories of learning and development. Motives are affected by the kind of goals set by students, whether they are oriented to mastery, performance, failure avoidance, or social contract, they are also affected by students' interests, both personal and situational, and they are affected by students' attributions about the causes of success and failure, whether they perceive the causes are due to ability, effort, task difficulty, or luck. So remember to mix it up and to enjoy motivating your students. I'll see you next week.